Hello and welcome to 1.35am. This is the third Fazbear Fright book and today I'm going to be doing an audiobook of the second story which is called Room for One More. Now, one thing to note is I have not actually read this story yet. So not only are you going to get um, like an audiobook from me uh, in a few parts, of course, I don't want to drag this out for two hours. Um, but not only are you going to get this audiobook, you're also going to get reactions from me. So we're going to see how this goes, uh, and hopefully you enjoy. Um, of course, if you don't have the book, then all of the words are on the screen, so you can read it with me. Anyway, this is room for one more. Let's begin. To tell the truth, Stanley didn't like the place. Something about the way it was hidden from passers-by made him wonder what secrets were being kept there. Was it even a legitimate business? Or were sketchy deals being made under the table? Stanley didn't know. When he was hired, the supervisor had told him that the job was on a need-to-know basis, and as far as the business was concerned, Stanley didn't need to know everything. After a year and a half on the job, the only thing Stanley knew for sure was that his paychecks always cleared the bank. To get to work, he had to walk through a storage yard stacked high with lumber, concrete blocks and steel girders. Concealed in the middle of all the building materials was a stairway leading underground. A single low wattage light bulb illuminated the dark steps just enough for him to find his way down safely. At the bottom of the stairs, he had to pass the same stinking bio waste bin he passed every night. It always had this exact same mixture of foul odours, something chemical, something like rotting food, and most disturbingly, something like how he imagined the smell of decaying fish. The stench set the tone for the night Stanley was about to spend. Just like the bio waste bin, Stanley's job stank, he scanned his ID badge, and the huge metal door opened with a groan that always seemed to express how Stanley felt about his upcoming shift. Sometimes he groaned right along with it. The facility was dark and lacked proper ventilation. Because of its underground location, there was always a level of dampness in the air that made Stanley feel clammy. Supposedly, the building was a factory, but even on the inside it provided no clue as to what kind of work might have been going on there. The building was a network of dim hallways faintly illuminated by sickly greenish lights. Networks of black pipes snaked overhead. Throughout the hallways were giant locked metal doors. Stanley had no idea what went on behind them. If the place were a factory, it would stand to reason that people were on the premises manufacturing something. Sometimes Stanley could hear the banging and rumbling of some kind of machinery behind the big locked doors. He assumed that there must be other workers in the building, people operating the machinery, but during his entire time on the job, he had yet to lay eyes on another human being. It was strange to be a guard, and not really know what it was you were guarding. Stanley walked down one of the hallways, hearing hissing and clanging from behind one of the metal doors, and then scanned his ID badge to enter the security office. He settled down at his desk, where he could watch all of the building's entrances and exits on the facility's high-tech monitors. So, straight off the bat, reading this like first three pages, uh, I'm already getting a sister location vibe. Don't know about you guys. I, like, there's green lighting, um, and it's kind of smelly, and it seems like a factory, but we don't know what it's for really. Anyway, we just have to read on. Stanley had been hired to work at this facility a year and a half ago. At his job interview, it became obvious that this job was unlike any other security guard position he had ever held before. The supervisor who hired him was a strange little bald man in a too large suit who fidgeted and seemed to not have a hard time meeting Stanley's eyes. It's not a difficult job, the man had said. You sit in the security office, watch the building's exit on the monitors, and make sure nobody 
gets out. Nothing gets out? Stanley had asked. In other jobs, I've watched to make sure nobody gets in. Well, this isn't other jobs, the twitchy little man had said, taking a sudden interest in the papers on his desk. Just watch the exits and you'll be fine. Yes, sir, Stanley had said. He was confused, but he didn't want to make trouble. He had been laid off from his previous position, and the bills were piling up. He needed this job. When do you think you can start? The man had asked him, looking in the general direction of Stanley's face, but still not meeting his eyes. As soon as you need me, sir, Stanley had been expecting a more rigorous interview. Usually, for security jobs, there are a lot of questions, personality tests, references to be followed up on, and an extensive background check. Companies wanted to make sure they weren't hiring the fox to guard the hen house, as Stanley's granny used to say. Excellent, the man had said, with what was almost a smile. We've had a sudden vacancy, I'm afraid, and we are in urgent need of someone to fill the position. Guy up on quid on you? Stanley had asked. In a matter of speaking, the man had said, looking past Stanley. Unfortunately, the prior security guard passed away suddenly. Very tragic. What happened to him? Stanley had asked. He knew there were inherent dangers in the job, but if the prior guard had been killed in the line of duty, he felt like he ought to be told about it. If this job was especially dangerous, he needed to know what he was signing up for and make an informed decision. Massive heart attack, I'm afraid, the man had said, looking down and shuffling some papers on his desk. We never know how much time we're given, do we? No, sir, Stanley had said, thinking of his dad, whom he had lost recently. The man had nodded thoughtfully, then looked at Stanley. But I think you'll find it an easy job. Just keep an eye on those exits, make sure everything that's supposed to be in the building stays in the building, and you'll be fine. Yes, sir, Stanley said. Thank you. He had reached out to shake the man's cold, bony little hand, and just like that, he had the job. As a result, Stanley had spent the last year and a half monitoring exits to make sure nothing got out, even though he wasn't entirely sure what that phrase even meant. Why had the man who'd hired him said nothing instead of nobody? What exactly was it that Stanley was watching for? He'd thought it... He thought he might ask the strange, twitchy little man about it one day, but since that brief job interview, Stanley had never seen him again. Stanley unscrewed the lid on his thermos of coffee and got ready for another long, lonely night. He wouldn't mind the lonely night so much if his days weren't lonely too. Up until two weeks ago, when Amber, his girlfriend for more than two years, dumped him, his days had been brighter. During his dull working hours, Stanley would actually look forward to the time that awaited him once he clocked out at 7am. He would walk over to the city diner across the street for a big breakfast. Eggs, bacon, toast and crusty oniony hash browns. Once his belly was full, he'd walk back to his apartment and fall into an exhausted sleep for a few hours. Afterward, he would wake up, eat a sandwich, do a little cleaning or laundry, and then play video games until Amber got off work at the grocery store at five. Amber always brought over ingredients for dinner. She loved the cooking shows on TV and liked to try out new recipes, which was just fine with Stanley. He loved to eat and had the belly to prove it. He wasn't fat, exactly, just well padded, like a comfortable sofa. Spare ribs with plum sauce, chicken ad adobo, spaghetti carbonara. Whatever new recipe Amber wanted to experiment with, Stanley was happy to eat it. Amber and Stanley would cook dinner together, and then they would sit across from each other at his little kitchen table and eat and talk about their days. Since Amber actually saw people at her job, she often had funny stories about things that had happened at the store. After they loaded the dishwasher, they'd cuddle on the couch and watch TV shows or a movie until it was time for Stanley to get ready for work. Most of their dates were cosy nights in, but on Stanley's nights off, they'd go out for dinner, usually to Luigi's Spaghetti House or Wong's Palace, 
and see a movie or go bowling. Stanley's time with Amber always felt happy and comfortable, and he had thought she felt the same way. But on the terrible day when she broke up with him, she said, This relationship is as stagnant as a frog pond. It's not going anywhere. Blindsided, Stanley had said, Well, where would you like it to go? She looked at him like this question was part of the problem. That's just it, Stanley. You don't have to ask. Stanley was barely 25 and Amber, the, and Amber was the first serious girlfriend he had ever had. He loved her and told her so, but he didn't feel emotionally or financially ready for engagement or marriage. He had thought that what he and Amber had was enough for now. It was just too bad that she didn't feel that way too. A few days before, Stanley had gone to his nephew Max's fifth birthday party at his sister the Melissa's house. It was the first time he had left the house to go anywhere. about the things their kids said or did. He had started thinking, what if Amber had been his last chance to settle down and have kids and he'd blown it? What if he was doomed to always be the bachelor uncle at his nephew's birthday party, standing on the sidelines and never somebody's husband, somebody's dad? It didn't help that Todd, Stanley's brother-in-law, had sidled up to him and said, hey man, I was picking up a takeout order at Luigi's the other night and saw your ex on a date with the manager of the snack space. Stanley had nearly choked on his birthday cake. She's dating somebody else already? It sure looked like a date to me. She probably had him lined up before she even broke up with you, Todd had said. Do you know the guy? Stanley had shaken his head. Well, I hate to break it to you, but he's tall and fit. A sharp dresser too. I checked out his car in the parking lot when I left. A sports car. Stanley was short and dumpy and didn't own a car. And if he did, it sure wouldn't be anything as expensive as a sports car. Maybe that's why his relationship with Amber had been stagnant. She wanted to climb the social ladder and he was content where he was. Stagnant Stanley, he should be called. He had to stop brooding, he told himself. He was at work, so he should be working. He drank his coffee and monitored the lack of activity in the building. All the exits were clear. They were always clear. He didn't wish for danger, but it would be something nice to have to do. Even with the caffeine, his eyelids started getting heavy, and his head felt like a bowling ball he was trying to carry on his shoulders. He started to nod off. This was typical. On any given shift, Stanley was likely to spend four of the eight hours fast asleep. That was one reason he didn't try too hard to look for another job, despite his boredom and loneliness. How many places would pay you for sleeping? Soon Stanley was snoozing away in his chair, his head lolled back and his feet propped up on the desk. Beep, 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 beep. Stanley was awakened by an alarm. Disoriented for a second, he mistook it for an alarm clock at home, but then he remembered where he was, and he checked the monitors. A motion sensor had been activated in a rent right there in the security office. Well, at least he wouldn't have to go far to check things out. Stanley stretched, rose from his chair, and grabbed his flash flashlight. He squatted on the floor, removed the cover from the vent, and shone the flashlight into darkness. He saw nothing. Really, the vent was too small for anything too dangerous to pass through it. Maybe a mouse or a rat had, activant, had activated the sensor. If the problem continued, he might fill out a report, though he was never really sure who received and read the reports he sent. 
and suggest that the management call a pest control company. Stanley yawned and went back to his chair. It was time to get back to his nap. Two hours later, he woke up with a start. He sat up, wiped the drool from his mouth and looked at the monitors. Nothing. But on his desk, there was an object that hadn't been there before. It wasn't immediately apparent what it was. Upon closer inspection, it appeared to be a toy, a doll of some kind with jointed arms and legs. It wore a tiny white tutu, and its little feet were painted white so it looked like it was wearing ballet slippers. Its arms were raised like a ballerina who was about to do a pirouette. Stanley smiled to himself at his rudimentary knowledge of ballet terminology. All those times of being dragged to his older sister's ballet recitals as a kid had at least taught him something. The simple jointed doll also reminded him a little of the jointed dots that had been in his high school art room. The wooden dolls could be arranged in a variety of positions to teach students how to draw the human form, but unlike the art room dolls which were faceless, this ballerina doll had a face. But it wasn't the face you would expect. It would seem logical for a ballerina doll's face to be painted like a beautiful girl's. Not like this one. Its face was clown white. Its big black eye sockets were blank and empty. It had no discernible nose. But its big black mouth was a toothless grinning gaping hole. The face didn't match the body at all. Why would somebody paint a ballerina's doll's face? in such a ghoulish style. Stanley's mind was full of questions. What was this weird thing? And what was it doing on this desk? Who had put it here? He picked up the doll. He spent a few moments bending it into different positions. Look, now she's doing the splits. Now she's doing a Russian folk dance. Stanley chuckled at how easily amused he was. He really did spend way too much time by himself these days. He should get a hobby. He tilted the doll over to make her do a headstand. A small voice from inside the doll's body said, We like you. What was that? Stanley said, tilting the doll over again. It must have been some kind of sound chip inside that reacted to movement. We like you. It was a little girl's voice, high pitched and giggly. Cute. Who's we? Stanley said, smiling down at the doll. I just count one of you, he tilted her. I like being close to you, the doll chirped. Well, believe me, it's been a while since a girl said that to me, Stanley said, holding up the doll to look at her better. Too bad you're tiny and not an actual human being. Kind of weird looking too. He tilted her head again. He wondered how many recorded phrases were in her vocabulary. You're so warm and squishy, the doll said with a giggle. Well, that was a new one, but it was true, or at least the squishy part was. He had been eating like an elephant ever since Amber broke up with him. He had always been a big eater, but this was different. Now he was eating because of sadness. Whole tubs of chocolate chip cookie dough ice cream, family sized bags of potato chips with French onion dip half a dozen fast food tacos in one sitting. Emotional eating, the experts on the internet call it. Emotional eating had made him a warm, squishy mess. He should start eating healthier, salads and fruit and grilled chicken. And he needed to go back to the gym. He had a gym membership. He just couldn't remember the last time he used it. Maybe before he and Amber got together. I think you're a good influence on me. He said to the doll, smiling as he tilted it. Take me home with you, the doll said with that little giggle in her voice. He set her back on his desk. I might do that, little dolly, he said. It's almost like you were left here as a present for me. But who would have left it for him? He looked again at the doll's ballerina body and strange mask-like face. A weird present, but I don't know. I kind of like you tilt. We like you, the doll said. So the feeling is mutual, Stanley said, chuckling again. 
He set the doll down and checked the monitors. Nothing at the exits. It was time to finish that nap. Stanley was at Luigi's Spaghetti House eating a table, eating, <laughs> eating a table, eating at a table by himself. He was cutting the spaghetti into little sticks with his butter knife, which used to drive Amber crazy. You were supposed to twirl it on your fork, she said, using your spoon to keep the noodles from falling off. To Stanley, this always seemed like an unnecessary delay of eating food, but he felt the same way about the chopsticks when they ate at Wong's palace, which Amber always insisted on using, while Stanley efficiently shoveled in his general so's chicken with a fork. But Stanley and Amber weren't eating anywhere together anymore. She was sitting at a cosy table in the corner with a handsome, well-dressed man. They were talking and laughing and feeding each other's bites off their plates. Stanley felt embarrassed to be sitting at his table alone, but Amber and her date didn't seem to see him. It was like he was invisible. Stanley looked around the dining room to avoid looking at Amber and her new boyfriend. At the head of the room, where there was usually a piano, was a casket. Stanley's dad lay inside it, his sunken cheeks too rosy with makeup, where the mortician had tried to disguise his death pallor. Everywhere he looked, Stanley saw someone he had loved and lost. He looked down at his plate to avoid seeing anybody else. His spaghetti had turned into a tangle of writhing, wriggling worms. The worms crawl in, the worms crawl out, or they eat your guts and they spit them out. Stanley remembered the gruesome song from the playground when he was a kid. It was morbid, sure, but what did they know of death back then? But now his childhood was gone, his dad was gone, Amber was gone. Why did everything good have to go away? He picked up the plate of worms and hurled it across the room. The plate shattered against the wall and left a red smear of spaghetti sauce studded with chopped up noodles. Stanley woke up grasping for breath. It's okay, he told himself. It was just a bad dream. It was five minutes until his shift was over and the doll that had been on the desk was gone. It was strange. Nobody but him was ever in here. Who would have come into the security office and taken it? Maybe the same person who had come in and left it in the first place. Whoever that was. For a split second, he considered filing a report about it, but realised there was no way he could. What would it say? Fell asleep at my post at 3.02am. Woke up to find a doll on my desk. Fell back asleep, woke up, and it was gone. That was a quick way to get fired. If Amber was still around, he would have a story to tell about something interesting that happened at work for once. These were some of the saddest moments of Stanley's already sad days, when he'd think, wait till I tell Amber, and then remember that there was no Amber to tell. Stanley held his nose as he passed the bio waste bin outside the facility. He emerged from the stairs to a day that was bright and sunny. After staying in a dark hole for eight hours, it always took his eyes a few minutes to adjust to the intensity of daylight. He squinted and blinked, like a mole that had just popped up from its underground tunnel. Stanley crossed the street to the city diner, sat down in his usual red vinyl booth, and turned his upside down coffee cup into the upright position. Almost as if by magic, Katie the server was there to fill it. Stanley knew a little bit about Katie, from making small talk with her. She was around his age, and was taking some classes at the community college now that her son had started preschool. You want the usual this morning, Stan? She asked. Her smile was friendly, and her eyes were very blue. She was prettier than Stanley remembered her being. Maybe he was just lonely. Since the breakup, he would often go for whole days in which Katie was the only other human he talked to. Actually, I might take a look at the menu today, Katie. If he was going to make a healthier choice, he might as well start now. Though it was hard to do with the irresistible smell of bacon wafting through the diner. Watching what other people were eating didn't help him either. 
The guy at the booth across from him was eating a tall golden butter and maple syrup drenched stack of pancakes. They looked delicious. Katie handed him the laminated folder. Changing it up this morning, are we? I thought I might. He scanned the menu, looking for healthier options. None of them sounded as tasty as his usual order, but if he was going to get less squishy, he was going to have to make some sacrifices. I think I'll take the mushroom egg white omelette with a turkey sausage and wholemeal toast. Kate C smiled as she wrote down his order. I'm impressed. Going on a diet, are we? He smiled and patted his belly. I'm thinking about it. After Katie left to put in his order, Stanley let his gaze wander around the restaurant. In the last booth, in the corner, an old man sat nursing a cup of coffee and reading the newspaper. He was at the city diner every morning, always alone, lingering over coffee long after his breakfast plate has been cleared. Stanley could feel the old man's loneliness, just surely as he could feel his own. He wondered, now that Amber had dumped him, if his fate was the same as the old man's. Would he grow old and be lonely as he sat for hours in public places just to have the illusion of some company? Wasn't that what Stanley himself was doing right now? Here you go, Katie said, delivering his breakfast with a smile. The egg white omelette was surprisingly decent, but when Stanley tried to eat his whole wheat toast, he had difficulty swallowing it. His throat had gotten sore suddenly and felt as if it must be swollen, partially shut. It was odd, he couldn't remember the last time he'd had a sore throat. He pushed his breakfast plate away. Does the healthy stuff not taste as good? Katie asked, clearing his dishes. You're usually a member of the clean plate club. No, it was good, Stanley said, his voice coming out croaky. My throat's just really sore, it makes it hard to eat. Well, there are all kinds of bugs going around. Lots of kids and teachers are out sick in my little boy's preschool. I hope you're not coming down with something, Katie said. Me too, Stanley said. But it was entirely possible that he was. Who knew how many germs were swirling around that damp, dark underground facility that no fresh air or sunlight ever reached? On the way home, he stopped at the drugstore and bought some sore throat lozenges. <laughs> I don't know what that word is. He popped one as soon as he paid for them. Swallowing was becoming more and more painful and more difficult. When Amber had come over on a daily basis, Stanley had kept his apartment reasonably clean. Now, when he walked into it, it felt like a doubly nasty surprise. There was the mess, but there was also the meaning behind the mess. It was a reminder that Amber was gone. The coffee table was cluttered with half-empty soda cans, hamburger wrappers, fried chicken boxes, and Chinese takeout containers. Dirty laundry was scattered in random piles on the floor. Part of him wanted to clean it up, but the rest of him said, what does it even matter? She's not coming back and there's nobody here but me to see the mess. Stanley unwrapped a throat tablet and popped it in his mouth. He was definitely getting sick. Great, that was just what he needed. One more thing to make his life a little more miserable. His mum had always been a big believer in steam when he or his sister was coming down with a cold, so he decided to take a hot shower. If congestion was what was causing his sore throat, breathing in some steam might help. Taking off his security uniform shirt, he had a hard time pulling his left arm out the sleeve. Once he finally got his shirt off, he could see the problem. His left arm was swollen to nearly twice the size of his right one. The arm felt weird too, numb like when a foot falls asleep. He shook his arm around trying to wake it up, but it lacked sensation. What kind of bizarre illness gave you a sore throat and a numb swollen arm? He was no doctor but he knew that these two symptoms did not go together. Stanley turned up the shower temperature as hot as he could stand it. When he held his left arm under the nozzle spray, he could feel neither the heat nor the jets of water hitting his skin. After he got out the shower, he put on a t-shirt and sweatpants, took two ibuprofen, popped another pill and crawled into bed. Whatever this illness was, maybe rest would fix it. 
He slept for eight hours, a dark, dreamless sleep. When he woke up, his throat felt like someone had cut it. He clutched his neck and drew his hand away and looked at it, almost expecting to see blood. He sat up slowly, his head fuzzy, achy and disoriented. His left arm was still numb and felt heavy and weak, an object that he was forced to drag around, but was, was of no use to him. He popped another throat pill, even though the first one hadn't begun to touch his level of pain. In the bathroom, he looked at himself in the mirror. His eyes were bloodshot, and he looked like he hadn't slept for days, even though he should have been well rested. A sore throat. What did mum used to give him for a sore throat when he was a kid? He flashed back to the days when he would stay home sick from school, and his mum would take care of him. Hot tea with lemon and honey. That was what she always had made for him. He was pretty sure he had some tea bag somewhere. He went to the kitchen and rummaged through the cabinets until he found a box of tea bags that had been there since who knows when. Tea doesn't expire, does it? He thought. He microwaved a cup of water and submerged the tea bag in it. He found a little plastic packet of honey in the drawer that was full of restaurant takeout packets of mustard ketchup and soy sauce. He stirred the honey into the tea. He remembered his mum saying that honey was soothing because it coated your throat. He didn't remember what the lemon was for, but he would have to do without it. He turned on the TV to check sports scores and sipped his hot drink. It helped a little bit. When he finished, he went back to the kitchen and opened a can of chicken noodle soup. Chicken soup was supposed to be good for sick people, right? He heated the soup on the stove, then took a bowl of it into the living room to eat in front of the TV. He quickly discovered that all he could manage was sipping the broth. The chicken chunks and noodles hurt too much going down. It felt like he was swallowing rocks. Stanley took more ibuprofen and sucked on another throat pill and hoped that he would feel better as the evening wore on. But the feeling of pain in his throat didn't go away any more than the feeling of anything in his left arm came back. He toyed with the idea of calling in sick, but he knew he couldn't miss out on eight hours of pay. Money was too tight, he barely had enough for rent and groceries as it was. When he put on his uniform, the left sleeve of his shirt was so tight he could barely bend his elbow. It was not an easy walk to work, with his painful throat and his lifeless left arm, but eventually he made it to the storage yard and down the hidden stairs. As usual, he held his breath, passing the, sink, passing the stinking bio waste bin that scanned his ID badge at the door. In the facility, he let his eyes adjust to the dim greenish light for a moment before heading to the security office. He checked the monitors and saw nothing out of the ordinary. Good. He was tired and in pain and ready for a nap. He leaned back in his chair and let the welcome oblivion of sleep overtake him. He awoke with a gasp, feeling like he was being watched. He looked around and checked the monitors. Nothing. But the doll was on his desk again. He picked it up and smiled at it. You again? He said. His voice was getting hoarser. Where did you come from? Is somebody playing a game with me? Maybe he had, he had a secret admirer, he thought, but he immediately dismissed the idea as ridiculous. What kind of weirdo secret admirer would leave him a ballerina doll? Not the kind of secret admirer he'd want, that's for sure. He tilted the doll over to activate her voice. We like you. She chirped in her happy little girl tone. I like you too, little dolly, Stanley said. I'm not sure why I do, but I do. Maybe having the talking doll there with him at work was like people who kept the TV on in the background all the time in their homes. A little bit of a noise was a reminder that even if it didn't feel that way, you weren't all alone in the world. Sad but understandable. The world was a lonely place. He turned over the doll again. Take me home with you, she said. Well, I was going to take you home with me yesterday, but then I woke up and you were gone. I guess you missed your chance, huh? 
Who do you belong to, anyway? He tilted her. Take me home with you. He examined the doll. Maybe you belong to the kid of somebody else who works here. I don't want to take away some kid's toy. You'd better be off with a little girl than with me. Tilt. Take me home with you, the doll said again. Too bad real women weren't this insistent on having his company. Some little girl could be real upset if her dolly's gone, and I'm a big grown man. I don't have any use for dollies. So why was he take? So why was he talking to this doll as if it could understand what he said and making his throat sore in the process? This virus or whatever it was must be making him loopy, he thought. And here he went again, tilting the thing to hear what it would say. Take me home with you. He set the doll down on the desk. It had officially crossed the line from cute to annoying. Okay, okay, if you stay put on this desk until my shift is over, I'll take you home with me. But now it's nap time. Nighty night. He leaned back in his chair and dozed off again. Stanley was running late for work. He was trying to get ready, but his big fat fingers were too clumsy to button the shirt of his uniform or tie or his shoes. He needed help, but he was utterly alone. Finally, knowing he would be terribly late if he didn't leave right away, he ran onto the street in his half-buttoned shirt and untied shoes. But when he looked around, all of the familiar landmarks of his neighbourhood were gone. Where was Greenblatt's Deli? Where was the Dutch girl dry cleaners? He looked up at a street sign and saw that the street names had changed. The sign that had once said Forest Avenue now said Fazbear Avenue. It made no sense, but he was lost. How could that be when he was just ten steps from the door of his apartment building? Finally, he hailed a cab and told the driver the address of the storage yard that hid his place of employment. None of the streets or buildings looked familiar as he rode through the city, but the driver seemed to know where he was going. Stanley told himself to breathe and relax. It was okay, things were under control now. The cab stopped on a dark side of the street that Stanley didn't recognise. Maybe the cab driver didn't know where he was going after all. Hey buddy, Stanley said, I don't think you've got the right address. When the cab driver turned around, his face wasn't human, it was a bizarre, robotic version of an animal's face, pink and white with a long snout, large ears and glowing yellow eyes. The face apparently hinged, split open, revealing the full orbs of the creature's eyes and a mouthful of knife-like teeth. It opened its jaw wider and lunged towards Stanley in the back seat, shattering the panel of glass that separated them. Had he screamed? Stanley wondered as he tried to shake off the nightmare. Probably his sore throat had rendered him so hoarse that he couldn't have screamed if he tried. But even if he had, who would have heard him screwed away in this tiny dark office? He could die in here, and nobody would notice. Nobody guards the security guard. What was that thing in his dream anyway? When he finally woke up all the way, and he could re reorient himself to the familiar surroundings, he noticed that the doll was gone again. It was weird. He kind of wanted to tell somebody about it, but who could he tell? At the city diner, Katie filled up his coffee cup. You look like you could use this, she said. Stanley winced as he tried to swallow a sip of the scalding liquid. Coffee was probably a bad idea. You want your usual or do you want your healthy routine again? Oatmeal, Stanley said, his voice a scratchy croak. Just a bowl of oatmeal. Katie knitted her brow. Are you okay, Stan? You don't sound so good. It was nice that she cared enough to ask. Sore throat's worse, he rubbed his neck. Don't think I can eat solid food. Okay. Oatmeal it is. But have you seen a doctor? You know, the drugstore around the corner has a little walk-in clinic. When I had an ear infection last month, they gave me some medicine that fixed me right up. They're pretty inexpensive too. No, no doctors. People always thought doctors could fix everything. But when Stanley's dad had gone so sick he couldn't work anymore, he'd gone to the doctor and taken every medicine and done every torturous treatment he had been told to do. Within six months, he was dead anyway. It's actually a nurse instead of a doctor at a clinic, Katie said. 
She's really nice. She'll ask you some questions, then she'll take a look at your ears, nose and throat, and then write you a prescription. It's just some kind of bug, and it's it'll run its course. Stanley rasped. He had to admit he did sound terrible, though. Suit yourself, Katie said. I'll get you on your ear meal, and I'm also bringing you a large orange juice on the house. A little extra vitamin C can't hurt. Thank you. Stanley was struck by how caring Katie was. He wondered if he was single. It would be nice to have someone who cared about him. Eating the oatmeal felt like swallowing hot sand. Hoping for relief, he sipped some orange juice, but it burnt his throat like battery acid. On his way home, he stopped at the drugstore and bought some throat pills that were supposed to be stronger than the ones he had been using. He doubted they would be strong enough. Once he was back in his apartment, he kicked off his shoes and collapsed on the bed without even taking off his uniform. He was asleep in seconds. He awoke seven hours later to a ringing phone. His mouth was dry as dust and his throat stung and burned. He reached for the phone with his good arm, but quickly discovered that it was numb and swollen now too. Awkwardly, he managed to lift the phone and put it up to his ear. Hello? His voice was a scratchy whisper. Stan, is that you? It was his older sister, Melissa. Yeah, hi sis. He hadn't seen her since his nephew's birthday party, but usually she called from time to time to check on him. You sound awful. Stanley could hear the wor- <laughs> Stanley could hear the worry in her voice. Are you sick? Come down with a cold, he said. He didn't want to say any more than the minimum number of words it took to communicate meaning. Talking hurt too much. No wonder, Melissa said, working nights in that dark airless factory, like being in the catacombs. I'm surprised you're not sick all over the time. Hey, listen, the kids are over at Mum's and Todd is bowling tonight. I made a pot of chilli and some cornbread. I thought I might bring some over and we could have dinner together. Even though he felt horrible, he was still grateful for the offer of company. At least he didn't have to face another evening alone. Sounds nice, he rasped. Okay, I'll be by at six. Do you need me to pick you anything up from the drugstore? A new throat, Stanley thought, but he said, no thanks. With difficulty, he dragged himself out of the bed and into the bathroom. He looked in the mirror to survey the damage, which was quite significant. Dark shadows had formed under his bloodshot eyes, and his skin had an unhealthy greyish cast. What worried him the most, though, was his right arm. Like his left, it was now so swollen that the sleeve of his uniform was like the casing of a fat sausage. He didn't know if he'd be able to take the shirt off without ripping it, probably best just to leave it on for now. He splashed some water on his face and managed to control his numb right arm enough to run a comb through his hair and squeeze some toothpaste onto his toothbrush. Brushing his teeth was so excruciating the tears sprang to his eyes. His throat felt like an open wound, and the inside of his mouth was also raw and inflamed. When he rinsed his mouth and spat out the water, it was streaked with red ribbons of blood. He looked at himself in the mirror again. The grooming he had been able to manage hadn't made much of an improvement. His chin and jaw were shadowed with stubble, but he didn't trust his numb arm enough to use a razor. This would have to do. He staggered into the living room and flopped on the couch, unable to find even enough energy to pick up the TV remote. Melissa, who had been a responsible person seemingly since birth, arrived at six on the dot as promised, carrying a large metal pot and one of the recycled tote bags she used for groceries. Her curly brown hair was pulled back in a neat ponytail, and she was still wearing the button-down shirt and I don't know what this is, uh, that she wore to work. Hey bro, she said, walking in the door. Her greeting was followed by, yikes, what happened here? Stanley knew things were messy, but he hadn't really given the appearance of the apartment much thought. Seeing it through Melissa's eyes though, he knew it was a disaster area. He was embarrassed, but didn't want to show it. He sat back on the couch and tried for a nonchalant shrug. Amber broke up with me, he croaked, 
Yeah, I know that, she said, looking around with the same repulsed expression she'd had when she was a little girl and he had to put worms in her hair. But what happened to this place? Amber wasn't the one who cleaned it, was she? No, I did. I just started caring less once she stopped coming over. Without Amber, cleaning didn't seem worth the effort. Few things did. Melissa's look shifted from disgust to sympathy. Poor little bro. Hang on, let me put this chili on the stove to heat up. She disappeared into the apartment's tiny kitchen, then re-emerged holding a handful of trash bags. It's kind of bad in there too. Were your dishes dirty? Pretty much, Stanley said. Melissa took a deep breath. Okay, here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to gather up all of these cans and bottles and load them in my car to take to the recycling centre. I'm going to hold my nose and gather up the trash and throw it away. And then I'm going to load your dishwasher and run it and hand wash any other dirty dishes that are left over. She looked down at the random pieces of clothing that had been tossed on the floor. I drew the line at touching your dirty socks and underwear. Those are your problem. Fair enough, Stanley croaked. Thank you, I wish I could help. His arms were so weak and heavy, he couldn't imagine picking anything up. No, you rest, you look like death holding a cracker, as Granny used to say. She dropped an old fried chicken box into the trash bag. Stanley let himself smile a little. Yeah, I never understood that expression. Why would death be holding a cracker? I never got it either, Melissa said. Why would the Grim Reaper need a snack? Isn't he just basically a skeleton? She looked around the room like a general figuring out a plan of attack. Listen, I'm going to make you a cup of tea with honey and lemon like mum used to make us, and then I'll really get going on this cleaning. I don't have any lemons, Stanley rasped. I bought the tea, the lemon, and the honey, Melissa said. Of course you did. You think of everything, Stanley said. Melissa smiled. I try my best. When they were little, Melissa had always organised what games they would play and how they would play them. At the time, he had thought that tendency was bossy and annoying, but now he saw it as it had good points, especially now that his life had descended into chaos. In a few minutes, Stanley was sitting with a mug of tea in his hands while Melissa launched a one-woman offensive against all the garbage in the living room. You're amazing, he said. If he couldn't help her, at least he could praise her. Well, it's nice to have an appreciative audience. My kids sure aren't, Melissa said, wrinkling her nose as she picked up an old Chinese food container with her forefinger and thumb and dropped it into a trash bag. Yeesh, I wonder what that used to be. Low mine, I think. I think that's how you say it, Stanley said. He winced as he, sw as he took a swallow of tea. I'm sorry I let things go so bad. It's not your job to clean up after me. No, it's not, Melissa said, tossing some wadded up taco wrappers into the trash bag. But it is my job to make sure you're doing okay. And I haven't been doing my job. That's not true, you've called me. Yes, I've called you several times since the breakup to make sure you're okay, and you've always said yes. And you showed up at Max's birthday party, which I thought was a good sign. But clearly I should have come over earlier and checked things out here. She nodded the top of the already full garbage bag. Because you little brother of mine, are definitely not okay. No, I'm not, he half whispered. He felt like he might cry, which would be embarrassing, crying in front of his big sister like he was a baby again. Stanley usually wasn't a crier. He hadn't cried since their dad had died. But looking at this messy life through Melissa's eyes, he could see how bad it was. Her life was so well balanced. She had a college degree, a job she liked at the courthouse, a nice husband, and two kids she was utterly devoted to. Compared to her life, his was pathetic and empty, and his throat hurt too. So much that the pain alone almost brought tears to his eyes. Melissa must have sensed his distress, because she patted him on the shoulder and said, I'll tell you what, let me take a break from cleaning and get us some dinner. The chilli should be hot by now, and you might feel a little better once you've had something to eat. Stanley sniffled and nodded. The chili was a family recipe, and it was usually one of Stanley's favourite meals. He was genuinely good for at least two bowls full, sometimes even three. But tonight, even though the chili was perfect and had shredded cheddar cheese on top and cornbread on the side the way he liked it, 
He couldn't eat much. The peppery broth burned going down, making it feel like someone was holding a lit match to his already inflamed throat. This is not the stand I know, Melissa said when he pushed aside his mostly full bowl. Do you remember what mum used to call you at mealtimes? Stan smiled a little. Her big hungry boy. She used to say you must have a hollow leg because she couldn't see where you put it all. Melissa cleared their bowls and started loading the dishwasher with two weeks worth of dirty cups, plates and silverware. Listen, I know you're going to argue with me about this, but why don't you let me make an appointment for you with a Dr. Todd and the kids and I see? She's really nice and easy to talk to. No doctors, Stanley croaked. An unwanted image popped into his mind of his dad in the hospital bed, pale and skeletally thin, tethered to plastic tubes that snaked all over his body. Melissa rolled her eyes. Yeah, I knew you'd say that. I, I knew you'd say that. Look, I know you've never liked going to the doctor, and you stopped going once you got to too old for mum to take you. Then you got even weirder about doctors after dad got sick. It's not weird, Stanley said. The doctors made him sicker, and he died. Chemotherapy. Radiation. They pumped him full of poison. Melissa shook her head. This was an old argument between them. Stan, Dad knew something was wrong, and he waited too long to get medical attention. Months and months. By the time he saw a doctor, it was too late to help him. They gave the chemo a try, but the cancer had already spread. It probably would have worked if they'd gotten to it earlier. She looked him in the eye. And now you're being too stubborn to go to the doctor too. It's like it's some kind of weird family tradition. Well, it's not one we should keep up. I don't have cancer, Stanley rasped. At least he had that going for him. I'll be okay. I know you don't have cancer, Melissa said. But you have a weird combination of symptoms. Your throat's sore and your arms look all stiff and swollen. Maybe it's just some kind of random virus. But I think you ought to get it checked out. It'll clear up, Stanley said. He knew it was a weird combination of symptoms too, but he wasn't going to admit it to her. Melissa sighed. I'll tell you what, I'm going to come over and check on you in three days. If you're not better by then, I'm taking you to the doctor, even if I have to get Todd and his big burly friends from the bowling league to help me drag you there. Okay, Stanley said, because he knew from experience that ultimately, there was no arguing with his big sister. Three days. Within an hour, Melissa picked up all the empty bottles and cans and washed all his dirty dishes, except for the dirty laundry on the floor. The living room was now clutter-free. Well, that's some improvement anyway, she said, looking around at the newly clean surfaces. I can't thank you enough, Stanley rasped. He was amazed at all the work she had done while he sat on the couch doing exactly nothing. I don't want you to thank me, Melissa said, putting on her jacket. What I do want you to do is call in sick to work tonight and get some rest. I'll think about it, he said, knowing he couldn't afford to pass up the money. Don't think about it. Do it. Melissa leaned over the couch and gave him a quick hug. And remember, if you're not better in three days, I'm taking you to the doctor. I remember. He knew she wasn't going to let him forget. Okay, I'll get out your hair now. She patted the, she patted the top of his head. What you have left of it. Stanley laughed. He had definitely inherited their father's receding hairline. You always were the mean one. Okay, this story's kind of slow, like the others, but I, I feel like we're going to get up to, to good parts soon. What do I think of it so far? I really do like it. This one's got quite a nice, quite a nice flow to it, I think. Um, and I think I can kind of foresee what's going to happen, but I don't want to say anything. Um, just in case you don't want it spoiled by my <laughs> my vision. Um, anyway, let's move on. Stanley had no intention of calling in sick to work. Since he already had his uniform on, he didn't need to do much to get ready after Melissa left. True, the walk to work was more tiring than usual. His throat burned and stung and his numb, swollen arms were so heavy he was practically dragging them like a ball and chain. Still, he made it, and now here he was again, descending the hidden stairs and passing the stinking bio-waste bin to arrive at his dark, subterranean workplace. Stanley made his way down the dim hallway. The greenish light gave his already pale skin an even sicker, sicklier cast. 
He scanned his ID badge and settled at his desk in the security office to check the monitors. As always, there was nothing unusual. It was the least demanding do job ever. He knew his sister wanted him to stay at home and rest, but why not come to work where he could nap and get paid for it? He leaned back in his chair and was soon snoring lightly. When the pain in his throat woke him a couple of hours later, the ballerina doll was on the desk again. It was weird the way the thing kept showing up like that, only to disappear again. He really ought to ask someone about it, but he never really saw anyone to ask. <clears throat> Out of habit, he picked up the doll and tilted it. We like you, it said. He studied the doll's empty eyes and black gaping grin. Really, who thought it was a good idea making a doll that looked like this? Yeah, 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 so you keep saying, he said. Where had the doll come from? Who would manufacture it? Had it been here in the factory? He turned it over to see if he could find a stamp of some kind on it. Take me home with you, the doll said. See, you keep saying that too, but whenever I'm ready to go home, you're always gone. You're sending me mixed messages, little dolly, Stanley said. He really ought to conserve his voice. It was barely above a whisper. He tilted the doll again. Take me home with you. Stanley set the doll down on the desk and reached for another throat pill. I tell you what, I can't take you home if you keep disappearing, but if you can stay put and are still on the desk when I wake up, you can come home with me. That's great, Stanley, he thought. Try to reason with an inanimate object. He was in some sorry shape. He leaned back in his chair and closed his eyes. Stanley was at work, but for some reason the greenish lights that usually provided the building's only illumination had been turned off. He remembered a school field trip to a cave. The tour guide had explained that the fish in the cave's underground pond had no eyes because even if they did have them, it would be too dark for them to see anything. The building was dark like that. His flashlight was the only thing that made it possible for him to find his way down the hall. He shined it on the walls, on the metal doors, on the floor ahead of him, creating small circles of light in the darkness. Was the whole building without electricity? He wondered. It must not be, because he could still hear the rumbling and clanging of the machinery behind the locked metal doors. He had a strong feeling that something was not right. He needed to get out of the office. He needed to get to the office to see if the security monitors were working, or if they were down due to the power outage. If they were, he guessed he would have he guessed he would have to walk around in the dark and check that each exit was secure. He shined his flashlight ahead. It lit up the sign reading Security Office on his door. The scanner for his security badge wasn't working, so he used the key he kept in case of emergency. The security office was as dark as the rest of the building. All the monitors were down. He shined the flashlight around the room letting its beam rest on familiar objects, the desk, the chair, the filing cabinet. He moved the flashlight's beam toward the left corner of the room. The beam illuminated a face. The face did not belong to a human. It was the face of a cartoon animal. A bear, maybe? Wearing a bow tie and a top hat. As Stanley shined his light on, the two sides of the face swung open like double doors to reveal a hideous, metallic skull made of snaking wires and cables. It stared at Stanley with blank, bulging eyes and sprang at him, its jaws snapping. Stanley woke with a start. He had never had nightmares like he'd experienced these last few nights while napping at work. What were these strange mechanical creatures that were haunting his dreams? Were these terrors caused by sadness at losing Amber? Or were they symptoms of his physical illness? Or maybe the two things were connected? One thing was for sure. He had never been so physically and emotionally unwell at the same time. He looked down at his desk. It was bare. The doll hadn't followed his orders to stay put. Stanley stood up and stretched. He shook his head, as if doing so might unscramble his, his confused brain. Of course, the doll hadn't followed his orders to stay put, he thought, because it was a doll. It couldn't understand what he was saying. No matter how many times it said otherwise, the doll didn't really want to go home with him. It didn't want anything because it wasn't alive and the words it seemed to say were just set, pre-recorded noises. None of this explained though, how the doll showed up on his desk and then disappeared. It couldn't move on its own, so who was putting it there and taking it away? 
with somebody playing some kind of prank. But who would play a prank on Stanley? To his knowledge, nobody else who worked here had ever seen him. After his shift, Stanley skipped the city diner. He would kind of like to see Katie, but his throat hurt too much to eat anything and the thought of food nauseated him. He caught a glimpse of his reflection in the store window, grey, sweaty, stubbly face and swollen, limp arms. No doubt about it, if he were holding only a cracker, he would look exactly like death. He thought of Katie recommending the nurse at the walking clinic. Maybe he should stop there. Nurses weren't the same as doctors. He remembered the school nurse when he was a kid as being very kind. He had to do something. He couldn't go on feeling this bad. The nurse was indeed nice, a blonde maternal woman who was around his mum's age. As soon as she saw him, she said, Wow, you feel terrible, don't you? Is it that obvious? Stanley asked. His voice was weak and husky. The nurse nodded. Sore throat? Yes, mum. A bad one. He didn't tell her about his numb arm. He was too afraid of what she might say. He didn't want to end up in hospital. When his dad had gone to the hospital, he didn't get out alive. Well, let's have a look at you and see if we can get you feeling better. She gestured for him to follow her into the tiny exam room in the back of the drugstore. She stuck a thermometer in his ear and read the results. No fever, but I think we'd better swab your throat and test for strep. The test wasn't pleasant. She told him to open his mouth wide and came at him with a long-handled Q-tip, which she plunged into his mouth and down his throat. The soft cotton was as painful as sharp metal against his irritated throat, and he gagged. When she pulled out the big Q-tip, the cotton was dotted with blood. Well, that's not good, she said, knitting her brow. Let me run this test and then we'll figure out what to do. In a few minutes she came back. No strep, but as irritated as your throat is, I think there's at least some infection, and the blood is worrying. I'm going to write you a prescription for some antibiotics, but if you're not seeing a difference by Monday, I want you to promise me you'll go see a regular doctor. I promise, Stanley said, despite the fact that he didn't have a regular doctor and had no plans to get one. Even though he felt physically awful walking home, he was also a little hopeful. He had taken action. He had real medicine now. Surely that would fix things. Stanley looked at himself in the bathroom mirror. It wasn't pretty. He had been wearing his uniform for almost 48 hours. He was pale and sweaty and he smelled as bad as that bio waste bin he passed every day. The uniform had to go. He unbuttoned the shirt, then unbuttoned the cuffs of his sleeves. He pulled on his left sleeve, but his arm was so swollen that it was tightly packed inside the, tru inside the tube of fabric. The right arm was no better. He pulled his sleeve and twisted his torso, hoping he could find some magical position that would make his arms break free out of their polyester prison. Finally, out of desperation, he grabbed a pair of scissors. He slid one blade under his left sleeve. It was a tight fit, but he got it into such an angle he could snip the sleeve open up the length of his arm. Though working left-handed was more difficult, he did the same with the other sleeve and shucked off the sweaty ruined shirt. It wasn't even his shirt. The company owned the uniforms and loaned them out to employees. The cost was definitely going to come out of his paycheck. He was unsteady on his feet in the shower and leaned against the wall to help to keep from slipping and falling. He let the hot water pound on his back in hopes that it would relieve some tension. He felt nothing, neither the heat nor the water in his swollen left and right arms. Exhausted from the Herzulean effort that undressing and showering had become, Stanley grabbed a t-shirt and some pyjama pants. He painfully forced one of the antibiotic pills down his throat with a tiny sip of water and then collapsed into bed. When he woke up and tried to stand, he immediately fell to the floor. His right leg wasn't bearing weight like a leg was supposed to. As soon as he attempted standing, it crumpled beneath him, as if it had no muscles or bones. Sitting on the floor, Stanley touched his right thigh and felt nothing. He slapped it, then punched it hard with his fist. Still nothing. The arm and hand he had used for punching were numb too. What was happening for him? Was it some kind of 
degenerative disease that might leave him in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. But if it was, wasn't it kind of strange for a degenerate, de degenerative disease to progress this rapidly? Maybe going to the walking clinic hadn't been enough. Maybe he should let Melissa make him a doctor's appointment. He probably needed to see some kind of specialist. Even if the doctor hurt him, it couldn't be worse than what he was feeling now. He wondered if, like his dad, he had already waited until it was too late to get help. With great effort, Stanley turned around, put his hands on the bed and pulled himself to standing. He walked in a slow shuffle, dragging his right leg behind him and letting his left leg do most of the work. How long had it been since he had eaten or drunk anything? He couldn't remember. Water. He at least had to have water. He shuffled to the kitchen, still clean from Melissa's efforts, and got a glass from the cabinet. He filled it with water from the tap and tried to drink. Agony. Swallowing even a sip of cool water felt like swallowing a ground up glass. He retched over the sink bringing up water pink with blood. He had thought he might try to heat up some soup, but if he couldn't even drink, eating was out of question, and the very thought of swallowing anything hot was unbearable. His phone rang, making him remember, miserably, that he had left it in the room. He dragged himself toward the insistent ringing, but by the time he got there, it had stopped. The caller ID said mum. He knew what she was like. If he didn't call her back, she would automatically think he was dead. Hello? Stanley? She answers on the first ring. Hi, Mum. Stanley tried to make his voice sound normal, but it came out husky with a little mouse-like squeak at the end. You sound terrible. Yeah, people keep saying that. He lay down on the bed to talk. No need to waste the energy it took to sit upright. Melissa came over to pick up the kids after she was at your place last night. She said you were a wreck. That's nice to hear. There was nothing like knowing your mum and your sister had been talking about what a loser you are. It's not something to joke around about, Stanley. His mum was using her stern voice, the, the one she had mastered when he used to get into trouble as a kid. She thinks you need to go to a doctor. I went to a walk-in clinic this morning, mum. The nurse wrote me a prescription a prescription for some pills. They've just not had time to work yet. I'm going to be fine. He didn't really believe he was going to be anywhere in the neighbourhood of fine, but he didn't want to scare his mum. She had gone through so much fear and worry when his dad was sick, she deserved to live the rest of her life in peace. Melissa also says she thinks you should get out more, see more people. Once you're better, of course. She says you're lonely. She's probably right. It's hard. I'm not over Amper yet. He felt a lump forming in his already painful throat. Just what he needed to cry to his mummy. Of course you're not over her, sweetie. It's only been two weeks, but over time your heart will heal and there'll be somebody else. Somebody who appreciates you for who you are. I know I'm biased, but I never thought that Amber was good enough for you. You know, I never thought I'd date again after your father had died, but a year and a half later I met Harold. You have to admit Harold's a really nice guy. He is, Mum. Stanley hadn't wanted to like Harold at first. He'd felt like it would be disloyal to his dad's memory. But Harold was good to his mum, and kept her from getting too lonesome. They went out to dinner every Friday night. On Sundays they walked in the park if it was sunny, or in the mall if it was rainy. They always held hands on their walks, which Stanley thought was sweet. He was glad they had each other. Now, do you need me to come over there and bring you some soup or some groceries or something? His mum asked. No thanks, mum. I just need to take my medicine and rest. He didn't want her to see how bad he looked. He knew if she did, she would be dragging him to the emergency room. Okay, but I'm going to call you tomorrow to check on you. And if you need me to come over, I will. Thanks, mum. And if you're not better by the day after tomorrow, do you promise you'll let Melissa make you an appointment with her doctor? He knew it was no use to argue with her. Melissa had inherited her stubbornness from their mum. I promise. I love you, Stanley. I love you too, mum. 
Saying those words made him feel sad and vulnerable. If he was going to be this sick, he almost wished he could be a little boy again. He could stay in bed in his jammies and his mum could take care of him and bring him hot tea and chocolate pudding and comic books. Nobody took care of you like that once you were an adult. After he hung up, he knew he couldn't stay on the bed. If he did, he would pass back out and not make it into work. With one hand on the wall for support, he limped into the living room, fell onto the couch and turned on the TV. Supposedly he was checking sports scores, but he couldn't focus enough to follow them. He just stared blankly at the lights and colours on the screen, thinking of only of how much his throat hurt and how fast his body was failing him. It was like he had turned into a discrepit old man overnight. All too soon, it was time to get ready for work. When he pulled on his uniform pants, the right leg was too tight. It looked weird having one normal pant leg and one that squeezed his thigh like a pair of ladies tights. His uniform shirt was still in a ripped up pile on his bedroom floor. He decided he would just wear his plain white t-shirt to work and then try to find a replacement uniform shirt in the storage room when he got there. Or not. What did it matter? No one saw him there anyway. He could go to his work in his underwear and nobody would be the wiser. Since the prospect of walking to work seemed impossible, he decided to take the bus instead. The short walk to the bus stop was difficult enough, and once the bus arrived he could barely lift his numb and swollen leg high enough to step into the vehicle. He could feel the people behind him shifting from foot to foot and waiting impatiently. As he stumbled onto his seat, the other passengers looked at him with concern. He sat down next to an older lady who got up and moved to another seat further back. He probably looked like he had something contagious. When he reached his stop, he pulled himself from his seat with great difficulty and lurched towards the door. He stumbled stepping down and fell onto the pavement. The fall should have hurt, but his arms and legs felt nothing. The absence of pain was more frightening than normal pain would have been. Are you okay, buddy? The bus driver asked. Stanley nodded and lifted his numb right arm to wave him off. He knew he wasn't okay, but it wasn't like the bus driver could help him. He didn't even know if a doctor could help him at this point. He was pretty sure the antibiotics weren't going to do the trick. He grabbed the bus stop stein post and used it to pull himself up to a standing position. He was unsteady on both of his feet. He reached down and slapped his left leg. He felt nothing. He should have told the nurse in the walk-in clinic about the numbness in his limbs. What had he been thinking? He staggered and stumbled down the sidewalk. Passers-by stared some seeming worried, others just annoyed like it inconvenienced them to see another person suffering. He made his way into the storage yard and held on to stacks of lumber for support as he tried to propel himself towards the stairs that led down to the facility. He grabbed the stair railing with both hands and focused on taking one painstaking step at, down at a time. His progress was too slow and he was afraid of clocking in late so he finally sat down on a step and scooted down on his bottom step by step like his nephew when he was a toddler and scared of the stairs. It wasn't dignified, but it got him to where he needed to go. He passed a stinking bio waste bin. At least his nose still worked. That was something, anyway. By the time he scanned his ID badge and the groaning door opened, Stanley was so exhausted it took all of his concentration to simply put one foot in front of the other. He had thought he might go to the storage room to find a fresh shirt, but looking professional no longer felt like a priority. Rest. That was his only priority. He dragged himself to the security office, scanned his ID badge, and collapsed into his chair, panting like a sick dog and sweating profusely. He was in no condition to be at work. He was in no condition, period. Looking down, he saw that his right leg and left leg were now equally swollen, stretching the fabric of his pants so tight it was in danger of ripping. Everything felt tight, his swollen arms, his swollen legs, even his chest felt tight. Was this what it felt like to have a heart attack? Could he be having a heart attack? He would call Melissa in the morning and tell her to go ahead and make that doctor's appointment. No more resting around with walk-in clinics and antibiotics. This was serious, and now he was less scared of doctors than he was of this illness. Amber. He kept thinking of Amber, when she broke up with him. He had just stared at her, stupidly, too much in shock to say much of anything. 
There was so much he could have said to her, so much that he needed to say. What if he never got the chance to say it? With shaky, sweaty hands, he dug through his desk and found a pen and paper. From some emergency reserve of energy deep within himself, he wrote, Dear Amber, with his numb arm and his unsteady hand, he kept on writing. Do you remember how we first met in the grocery store? I brought my stuff to your register. You checked me out, and all that time I was checking you out. I was too nervous to ask you on a date, but I kept coming to the store and buying things I didn't need, just so I could see you. Finally said, do you like me or something? I think I blushed, but I said yes. And you said, then why didn't you ask me out? When I did and you said yes, I think it was the happiest I've ever been. Amber, I know I wasn't always the best or most exciting boyfriend, but I want you to know that I truly loved you and still do. I've been really sick lately and if you're reading this, it's probably because something bad has happened to me. Please don't feel sad for me. I just want you to know that I'm sorry I didn't make you happier and give you what you needed. But it wasn't because I didn't love you. I do, and very much. I wish you lots of happiness in your life, as much happiness as you brought me when we were together. Love always, Stanley. There, that was it. He was no poet and his handwriting looked terrible, but he had said what he needed to say. Trembling and exhausted, he folded up the letter and put it in his pocket for safekeeping. When he leaned back in his chair and closed his eyes, he didn't doze off as usual. Instead, he passed out, as if somebody had hit him in the head with a baseball bat. When he regained consciousness, he felt shaky and sweaty and tight. Tight is the only way he could think to describe it, like somehow his body had been stretched to his limit. His pants were stretched, snug across his legs, and now his t-shirt, roomy, when he had put it on just a few hours before, clung onto every bulge and contour. But it wasn't just the clothing that was tight, his skin felt tight too, as if it might burst open like the peel of an overripe fruit. The ballerina doll was on the desk. He was in no mood to play, he didn't pick it up, he didn't even want to touch it. I like being close to you, it said. Sure you do, he mumbled, but then he thought, wait. He put his face in his hands and tried to make some sense of his confused mind. Doesn't the doll only talk when you tilt it over? Before, it only talked when I tilted it over. Maybe I didn't really hear that. Maybe I'm so sick I'm hallucinating. Take me home with you, it said. Stanley knew he heard it that time, but he didn't answer. One of his many recent problems was his tendency to talk to inan inanimate objects. Melissa was right. He needed to get out more. All this solitude wasn't good for him. He was already worried about his physical health. He didn't want to have to worry about his mental health too. But why was the doll talking if no one was activating it? Maybe it was broken. Maybe there was some problem with the me mechanism that caused the voice activation to sh shut off. Whatever the cause was, Stanley didn't like the effect. We like you, it said with that same little giggle that he had once found charming. With a shaking hand, Stanley picked up the doll to inspect it. Maybe there was a switch he hadn't noticed before that controlled the voice mechanism. Maybe he could turn the thing off. The doll was missing an arm. Strange. It had been intact the night before. What happened to your arm? Stanley asked. Take me home with you. The one-armed doll said. The one-armed doll said. No. He had said that he wasn't going to talk to the doll anymore. So why was he doing it? For some reason, the doll didn't seem so cute anymore. He couldn't say why, but the thought of having it in his apartment was terrifying. He wasn't so crazy about having it here, either. Stanley remembered that when he had handled the doll the night before, he had noticed a tiny scratch in the paint job on his face. Tonight, the scratch wasn't there. Another night, he remembered now, he had noticed that there had been a small tear in the doll's tutu. Tonight, as it had been last night, the tutu was fine. We like you. We. Suddenly, Stanley understood. It hadn't been the same doll on the desk every night. It had been a different doll every time. 
Sure, it had been the same type of doll, but there had always been slight differences. But what did it mean? Whatever it was, it was weird and upsetting, and he didn't want any part in it. He opened a drawer in the desk, dropped the one-armed doll inside it, and slammed the drawer shut. There, out of sight, out of mind. After he saw the doctor and got whatever these health issues were straightened out, Stanley decided he was going to look for a new job like Melissa was always encouraging him to do. She said they were always looking for good security guards over at the courthouse where she worked. That way, he could work in the daytime and actually see people and talk to them. Maybe he and Melissa could take their lunch breaks together sometimes. If he worked days, his schedule wouldn't be the opposite of all his buddies anymore and maybe he could start hanging out with the guys again. He could invite them over to his apartment, which he could keep clean, and they could order pizza and watch football together. Who knows, he might even start dating again. He would start by asking Katie out. Even if she turned him down, asking her would be good practice, a step in the right direction. As soon as he got his health back, a job at the courthouse could be the solution to all his problems. It would be a sunny, sociable workplace. Not like this one all dark and creepy and lonely. Sonny thought about the future and felt a, sen a small sense of hope. He told himself that he wasn't going to fall asleep again. He was going to do his job. The screens were called monitors because he was supposed to monitor them. But his body, for whatever bizarre medical reason, had stretched beyond his limits. An exhaustion overtook him. His head lolled back as he slumped in his chair and his eyes shut. He descended into blackness. He was in a dentist chair. The dental assistant was a robot outfitted as a ballerina. Unlike the little dolls, her face was painted to look feminine and pretty, with long eyelashes, pink lips and pink circles on her cheeks. Her blue metal hair was sculpted into a ballet bun. She hovered over him, holding what looked like several wide belts. We have to strap you in, she said her voice feminine and sultry. The doctor doesn't like squirming. She bound Stanley to the chair with leather straps around his shoulders, his arms, his legs. He wanted to move, wanted to fight being restrained, but he could not will his body to act. He was paralyzed. The dentist entered wearing dark safety goggles and a surgical mask. Stanley was leaned back, his mouth open, his hands in a white knuckled grip on the arm's armrest. On the chair's armrest, the dentist was silent and rough and was trying to stretch Stanley's mouth to open wider and wider. No, Stanley was saying in his head, Stop! It won't open that wide! It can't! The dentist reached up and tore off the goggles and the mask. The face Stanley saw was a clown white mask with big black eye holes and a black gaping grin. Yellow glowing irises shined through the black eye sockets, the face. He knew that face. The thing's hands pushed his mouth open wider and wider, wider than he could stand. His lips were going to split at the corners, his jaw was going to break. Stanley woke up, but the feeling of stretching didn't stop. That face in the dream, Stanley knew that face. It was... Stanley was distracted from his thoughts by a sensation on his own face. There was something moving on his face. The ballerina doll was standing on his chin, using her one arm and one of her legs to try to stretch his mouth open wide enough. Wide enough for what? Stanley's heart raced as he finally understood. Wide enough so she could fit inside. Oh, <laughs> chills. Stanley raised his numb right arm and swatted the doll away. She was light and sailed across the room, hitting the wall with a thud and landing in a crumpled heap on the floor. He braced his hands on the desk to pull himself to his feet. As he stood, he felt a tightening in his arms, his legs, his belly, his chest. He knew now that what he was feeling was the sensation of dozens of tiny limbs pressing on his skin from the inside. Inside his arms, his legs, his chest, his belly, how many of them were in there? The sore throat had started after the night the doll, the first doll appeared. No wonder it hurt too much to eat or drink or anything. Night after night, the dolls had been climbing into his mouth and down his throat as he slept, making their way through the narrow passageways of his body like explorers in a dark, damp cave. 
the realization nauseated him. He felt the urge to vomit, but there was nothing in his stomach to bring up, nothing but acid and fear. He wished he could go back to not knowing what was wrong with him, to just thinking he had contracted some unusual virus or infection. People always said that when it came to physical conditions, knowing was better than not knowing. In this case, they were wrong. Knowing was much, much worse. Stanley staggered out of the office and down the hall. Everything in his head screamed at him to run, but he was too weak to run. The walls of the facility seemed to be closing in around him. He had never liked this place. He had to get out of here for good, he told himself, and he would do it even if he had to crawl. The pressure inside him was the building. It felt like the dolls were angry, like their many tiny fists were punching him and their many tiny feet were kicking him. But he saw the exit sign's green glow up ahead. Green means go, he told himself. If he could just get out, if he could be where there was moonlight and fresh air to breathe, he could figure out what to do. He leaned against the wall and hobbled to the exit sign. Outside, he tried to take a breath of fresh air, but instead, instead sucked in the stench from the bio-waste bin. He was so worn out and ill that he just wanted to just lie down on the pavement, but he had to figure out a way to make it up the stairs. Up the stairs and into a cab and straight to the emergency room, where he would tell them, what? There are dozens of little dolls living inside me. They crawl down my throat when I sleep. There was no doubt what ward of the hospital a statement like that would land him in. But maybe if he could convince a doctor to take an x-ray, they could see what, that the dolls were real. Voices. Stanley's thoughts were interrupted by tiny, muffled, little girlish voices. They were muffled because they were coming from inside of him. From his left arm. I like being close to you. From his right leg. We like you. From his belly. You're so warm and squishy. Stanley stumbled backwards, almost falling. Standing was becoming more and more difficult. The pressure was building inside him, becoming unbearable. He felt like he might explode. Could that happen? Could a person actually explode? The tiny one-armed doll was standing framed in the facility's doorway, posed like she was about to do a pirouette. The yellow irises of her cavernous black eyes focused on Stanley like lasers. Her smile was wide. She tilted her head in a way that under other circumstances might have been cute. Isn't there room for just one more? She chirped. All of Stanley's strength was gone. He fell to his knees. The one-armed doll leaped toward him with the grace of a ballerina. Stanley couldn't help it. He opened his mouth to scream. Oh my god, okay. That is great. That is such a good... That actually might be one of my favourite stories in the series so far. It was kind of unexpected, but I I guess, like, I had a few theories halfway through that I didn't want to say. Uh, I definitely thought, obviously, these mini Renas, which are the, which are the dolls in this case, they are definitely uh, doing something to him. Uh, and when I realised that all of his body was numb, I was like, it has to be them. They have to be inside of him or something. Or, like, because we know from the other two stories that the, the second story in each book is always about like body swapping and this follows the same theme which is very interesting um but i i, I really like it this is a really good story um good ending too i i reckon um and actually i think it was quite a short story i'm pretty sure um but yeah what do you guys think of it uh, I will be doing more audiobooks in the future. I think the next one I'm going to do is the next, um, the next book or the next story. Sorry, the new kid. I have no idea what this is about. Um, but yeah, once I've done this one, I will do literally all of the Fazbear Fright stories so that you guys have all of them to just listen to and look at. Um, but I hope this helps. I hope. You enjoyed I really enjoyed this story what do you guys think of it what theories do you have from it I'm gonna make a few theory videos soon um, and yeah I guess I will see you later thank you so much for watching and goodbye